Thank you all for coming. My name is Dane Scott. I direct the Mansfield uh, Ethics and Public Affairs Program, and this event is part of the uh, Mansfield Brown Bag Series, Mansfield Center's Brown Bag Series. And so I welcome you here. I think we have a great topic for a noon talk right before lunch. What is good food? Or what makes food good? Uh, I wanted to tell you we're also having another event next week as part of the Mansfield Center Brown Bag Series, and that's Jason Blackstock uh, is going to talk about geoengineering the climate technologies for rebalancing and reinforcing uh, global inequity. And then on Wednesday night, he's going to give a talk on managing our living planet, exploring the evolving role of science in public decisions. Uh, so I hope you'll keep those in mind as well. And it really is a, a pleasure to introduce Paul Thompson. Paul's a good friend, uh, something of an academic hero. He's, uh, he's a philosopher that uh, works on things that matter. <laughs> uh, and uh, he actually is something of a trailblazer in that he has picked topics uh, that other philosophers really haven't focused on, uh, which are extremely important, such as food and agriculture. And he's actually made a very distinguished career out of it. And so we're very fortunate to have Paul here. And Paul is the Kellogg Chair at Michigan State University in Food and Agriculture. And he's worked on many important issues, such as sustainability, uh, animal welfare, um, risk and precaution, and uh, agrarianism. And I wanted to recommend a couple of books to you that I've found really helpful written by Paul. Uh, this one is The Spirit of the Soil, Agriculture and Environmental Ethics. And he does uh, have an extremely good discussion in this book on industrial agriculture, very sophisticated discussion, and also the connections between agriculture and environmental ethics. And then his most recent book, which deals a lot with agrarianism and sustainability, called uh, The Agrarian Vision, which is a synthesis of a lot of work that Paul's been doing over the years. And this is the first time uh, Paul's been here during winter. He's been here uh, many summers, and we had a great talk a few years ago at the Peace Farm, uh, where he talked about agrarianism, and it was a great setting for that. And so I'd like you to welcome Paul Thompson. Thank you. I always really do enjoy coming to uh, Missoula, and uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here on such a beautiful day. Uh, what I'm going to do in this uh, talk is explore um, some different ways in which we think of food as good, um, and uh, it's, in some respects it's a, a kind of a, a play on the idea that uh, when we're thinking about something being good, we're thinking about it uh, having uh, certain kinds of aesthetic characteristics and also ethical characteristics and also uh, economic uh, characteristics. Uh, what I'm going to do is focus on uh, three seemingly somewhat unrelated uh, problems in food ethics, and I'll give you a kind of uh, quick and dirty sketch of each of these problems. Um, and then um, I'm going to end by uh, suggesting, although I don't think I have a detailed argument for this, uh, that it's actually helpful for uh, seeing these uh, challenges as more closely linked uh, to one another than we typically do. Uh, so I'll start out with uh, hunger and food security, and I'll be looking at that primarily from a, a global perspective, not so much from a U.S. perspective. Uh, then turning to a more uh, U.S. orientation, looking at uh, diet and obesity, uh, and then finally thinking a little bit about some of these uh, food, community, and culture uh, types of questions. To, so starting out with the focus on food security, I'll. Uh, point to work by uh, two uh, living philosophers, probably two of the most influential uh, living ph philosophers, one of them, uh, Peter Singer, uh, who's uh, been uh, influential both for his work on animals but also for uh, work that he's done throughout his uh, career on world hunger, uh, and uh, Amartya Sen, who's uh, 
a Nobel winning economist, but we like to claim him in the discipline of philosophy. He writes uh, uh, very sophisticated uh, philosophy as well. Uh, and I'll start out by talking a little bit about uh, Singer's uh, extremely influential work uh, on uh, world hunger, uh, which uh, works out of uh, the idea, a pretty straightforward idea, that uh, uh, people are hungry when they don't have access to um, uh, sufficient amounts of food. Uh, and uh, Singer moves forward into this, uh, developing arguments for um, why we really have responsibilities uh, for doing something about this. Uh, and uh, it uh, suggests that we have, et we, meaning um, better off people, well off people, um, Americans, uh, Europeans, uh, Singer himself is an Australian, uh, have uh, moral obligations to ensure uh, that sufficient food is available uh, globally. Uh, and there are essentially two ways that we can think about doing this. One of them is that we can increase farm production, uh, and then uh, secondly, uh, we can offer food aid to people. Uh, and Singer's uh, original uh, paper on this back in the 1970s uh, really focused on famine relief, and it focused on uh, making gifts to support uh, uh, food aid uh, to hungry people in the developing world. Um, there is, however, uh, a bit of a problem with Singer's view, and I'm not going to speak at detail, in detail about this in the present paper, uh, but uh, uh, it's that uh, access uh, doesn't necessarily uh, equate with availability. You can have uh, food uh, that uh, is available and yet be unable to access it, uh, and that would actually be the situation in most developed countries where there's a hunger problem, as in the United States. Uh, there's no shortage of food in the United States, yet we have hungry people uh, because they don't have uh, the resources uh, to purchase food. Uh, and Sen uh, developed his analysis uh, by focusing on uh, a famine in uh, Bengal uh, in 1943 in which uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, suffered from hungry and many starved, uh, many died, uh, not because there was no food available, there was plenty of food available, but uh, uh, rapid uh, inflation and uh, depression in the price of, low, of wages for low-wage workers uh, made that food um, uh, impossible for them to access. So Sin, Sin has developed a, um, uh, an, an alternative analysis, uh, which is that to, to be capable of uh, having um, uh, access to food uh, requires having a secure food entitlement. And uh, Sen would argue that uh, there are really three ways to unpack uh, this idea of an entitlement. Um, one is that you can grow it. If you are growing food, uh, then you're, you have a secure food entitlement. Uh, but for most of us, uh, we go out and purchase food. And so our food entitlement uh, is based on um, our income on our, and on our ability to have a sufficient amount of income uh, to buy uh, food. Um, this ties uh, the right to food or uh, the food entitlement to uh, the economy in a much uh, larger way, and employment and inflation uh, become uh, critical factors. Uh, we could actually unpack this uh, in a little more detail uh, by understanding uh, three kinds of entitlement. One is uh, the direct in production entitlement. Um, a second would focus on earned income. Uh, and then if you don't have enough in income, you might actually uh, get a gift or grant, uh, either of money or some uh, negotiable type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, entitlement. Uh, we still refer to this as food stamps, even though the U.S. Department of Agriculture has uh, started using alternative terminology. But we have uh, entitlements that allow uh, low-income people to uh, get access to food, or in some cases, Cases, it's simply uh, charities. Uh, the uh, Catholic Church is actually one of the major guarantors of uh, food in many parts of the world uh, through a kind of uh, uh, grant program. So how, how do these things, uh, how do these uh, entitlements uh, become secure, uh, and how should we think about this uh, from the standpoint of ethics? Um, now here I want to uh, focus first on the direct production entitlement. Now this seems pretty straightforward. You're out there growing food. Um, and uh, if you have a garden, you may be holding a job or doing some other things. But if you're a developing country farmer uh, and uh, food is your primary source of um, 
uh, support your subsistence occupation. Uh, you are going to grow food and you're going to eat it and feed it to your family, uh, but you need to be able to produce at least a certain amount of cash income from that uh, in order to uh, be a viable farmer. You have to uh, replace your tools. Uh, you probably have uh, some other obligations. Occasionally you need to get access to some health care uh, or to some non-food items. Uh, and so uh, for farmers, um, the security of your food entitlement uh, is actually linked to the price of food. Uh, if the price of food falls so low that uh, you can't recover the cost that you incur in producing food, uh, then your direct entitlement to food through growing it yourself uh, is actually put into jeopardy. Uh, and this becomes especially dramatic if we think about uh, uh, farmers in some parts of the world who are, who are actually growing uh, crops that uh, they can't eat. Um, uh, in uh, Mali, where we have a program at Michigan State, uh, the uh, poor farmers are growing cotton, poor farmers are growing coffee and tea, uh, and other kinds of crops that uh, uh, they, of course, have to sell in order to uh, then convert that into a cash entitlement to uh, access food. So, um, you know, for farmers, it's good when their prices are high, uh, but the security of an exchange-based entitlement uh, is going to be uh, better, it's going to be more secure uh, when the price of food goes down. Uh, if you're buying food, you want food to be, you want food prices to be low. Uh, so uh, perhaps it's obvious, but uh, we get into this situation uh, where there's just a direct conflict between the food entitlements that are based on direct production and the food entitlements that are based on earned income. And how do we address this? Well, this is not primarily a philosopher's problem. It's something we think about in terms of economics and policy, but uh, oops, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The thing that I need to point out here uh, before that is that actually about half of the poorest people in the world, half of the people who are uh, considered to be in extreme poverty according to World Bank standards. Right now the World Bank standard for extreme poverty is uh, uh, one euro a day uh, or less. A euro is worth about a dollar thirty. So these are people who are making uh, less than a dollar thirty a day. About half of these people uh, are farmers. Uh, the estimates vary. Uh, some would say that uh, approximately 70 percent of the poorest people in the world actually depend on farming uh, for their income um, because they're wrapped up in the farm economy. But at any rate, uh, it's uh, roughly a trade-off between uh, urban poor who depend on food price being down and at least equal numbers of rural poor uh, who would like food prices to be up. So we might address this through um, a sophisticated program of gifts or grants, uh, but if we're not careful, this can actually make the problem even bigger. And so to understand that a little bit, let's think about how we um, address this problem in the United States. This is not uh, a very good diagnosis of our food problems. Our uh, producers uh, complain and would like to make more money, uh, but most of them are food secure. Uh, most farmers, uh, the vast majority of farmers in the United States uh, are food secure. Uh, so we basically address this through um, economic growth, through a transition to where we got, we, we're now to the point where uh, less than 2 percent of our population, globally 50 percent of the poor are farmers, but uh, less than 2 percent of our total uh, population are farmers and uh, uh, relatively small uh, small numbers of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I don't think the census actually uh, indicates significant figures of people who report themselves as being farmers who are in, uh, uh, in poverty in the United States. Uh, so we've kind of grown ourselves out of this and we've grown ourselves out of this uh, through um, um, programs of subsidies. Uh, we've subsidized farm production. Uh, this, this, this tension that I'm describing was real in the United States during the Depression era, and uh, farmers found themselves uh, having to destroy crops in the field in order to uh, keep food prices up. They couldn't recover the cost uh, that they were getting for their production, uh, and so they literally uh, cut down or burn crops in the field. Uh, and that was the point at which our current uh, agricultural policies uh, were established uh, so that those crops could come into the marketplace uh, at uh, lower prices, uh, be available, and farmers would be able to uh, recover uh, 
their full costs and uh, continue to farm. Uh, and uh, as uh, that program matured through the 1950s, uh, we started having um, l extra production. Uh, and so we started relying on uh, exporting a lot of that extra production. And we exported it uh, both by selling it, um, sometimes below the cost that it, uh, it took, um, that American farmers incurred uh, to actually produce it. The government would uh, subsidize the cost on world markets uh, and also through our Food for Peace problem program, uh, which was our primary program of food aid, uh, which gets us back into uh, this uh, international situation uh, where we're, the word that uh, others use is dumping um, our excess production on global markets, uh, and our excess production is now in competition uh, with uh, that that's being produced by uh, this one half of the world's population who are in extreme poverty making less than $1.30 a day. Uh, and it's actually uh, creating a situation in which they can't sell their food. Uh, where uh, many uh, stories, I'm not going to tell these stories in detail here, uh, of uh, uh, cases where food is available during famines uh, locally and uh, they're unloading uh, the bags that say uh, gift of the United States of America and uh, the local farmers who uh, uh, then can't sell their food and uh, they wind up being the victims of the famine uh, rather than the people in the cities. Um, so uh, in many respects uh, this is uh, what I would call the fundamental uh, problem of uh, food ethics, uh, and it's one that I think uh, needs to be borne in mind as we, we think about uh, uh, other issues in food ethics. It's not a problem that I think that we have uh, figured out how to solve uh, in economic terms. Meanwhile, we've been producing plenty of food um, uh, in the United States, and we actually have too much to eat, uh, and that brings me to uh, challenge number two. Uh, which is uh, this idea that we um, are now starting to see uh, obesity as an ethical problem. Now, obesity has historically been thought of as uh, an ethical issue. Uh, in, the ancient, in ancient Greece, uh, the idea of temperance, uh, not eating too much, uh, got a number of different treatments uh, and uh, was uh, something that uh, you see throughout that tradition. It carried over into uh, medieval philosophy uh, with uh, the idea that gluttony is uh, one of the seven deadly sins. Uh, and uh, I've, I'm not going to go through all of these points, but uh, here's uh, uh, Pope Gregory the Great's analysis of, uh, of uh, gluttony. Um, I'm not sure that it matches up quite with our ideas of what the causes of obesity are, uh, but uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas also wrote about uh, uh, gluttony, and he associated it with uh, uh, these uh, five characteristics, um, uh, and uh, only one of these really focuses on eating too much. Um, you know, dainty eating is, uh, is uh, a form of gluttony for Aquinas. Uh, as we move into uh, the modern era, uh, um, Kant uh, describes the uh, problem of, uh, of uh, dietary ethics uh, under the heading of duties to oneself. Uh, and uh, Kant is focused on the idea that uh, we should strive to realize our rational capabilities, but he recognizes uh, that we have to take care of our bodies. We have to attend to our animal natures uh, in order to do that. Um, others who follow Kant actually um, uh, stress the idea that uh, this isn't really a moral responsibility at all, uh, that uh, rational self-control is just a problem of prudence uh, rather than morality, and they want to make a distinction uh, between the idea that uh, this is uh, something that's ethically significant and just something that's kind of uh, common sense uh, prudential behavior. This move actually becomes uh, uh, bound up in an idea uh, that uh, nutrition and bodily health are uh, scientific issues and uh, that there's really no place uh, for morality uh, in talking about them. Uh, again, I could talk about this in uh, much more detail, but let me just uh, cut to the chase because uh, we find ourselves today uh, in a situation where we're, we're starting to talk about uh, obesity not just as a matter of, uh, of, uh, of self-interest or prudence, but as a social problem. Um, uh, obesity is a key factor for uh, disease, uh, and we're all, as a society, bearing the increased costs uh, 
that are associated with this. I can relate to this personally, but I won't tell that story right now. Um, uh, and uh, so we're starting to see this as something that we need to cope with uh, as a social problem uh, and not simply as a matter of uh, individual prudence. So how do we think about this? Well, uh, here I'm drawing on some recent work by uh, some friends of mine, some Dutch philosophers, uh, and their names are so complicated that I'm not going to try to pronounce them. Um, but uh, they have argued that uh, we really need to understand this by uh, thinking about the links between obesity and responsibility. And we focus first on a sense of causal responsibility. We try to understand what are the causes uh, for this uptick in obesity, right? I mean, as we've seen, you know, there have been, you know, gluttonous people and people who are overweight uh, since antiquity, uh, but this idea that we now have a rise in obesity and it's creating a social problem uh, is something that's recent, and we have to uh, first understand what the causes of this are, and then once we have a diagnosis of the causes, then we can start to think about where the moral or political responsibility uh, would really uh, start to lie. Uh, and uh, uh, that we're going to primarily understand in terms of who it is that should be doing something about this uh, uptick in obesity. And they come up with uh, an analysis that's uh, uh, remarkably commonsensical for a group of philosophers. Uh, they really first fo focus on three possible causal models. Uh, the first is that this is just a problem in individual decisions. Uh, people are making bad decisions about what they should eat. Uh, the second is that uh, somehow the social environment uh, has uh, caused people to uh, make poor decisions or is encouraging uh, bad behavior. Uh, and then finally, uh, they consider the possibility, they actually use this term genes. It's really a little more complicated than just genes, but the idea that there are uh, genetic bases that uh, are tied to uh, uh, physiology, brain chemistry, uh, and that uh, we're actually starting to see uh, some uh, medical causes for the uptick uh, in obesity. Now, if it's uh, primarily a, a problem of uh, genes, then we get a pretty straightforward uh, moral analysis. Uh, in that case, the responsibility uh, lies with the medical community. This is a problem that the medical community uh, should solve, and uh, we should be uh, spending NIH money to uh, develop cures for this, uh, and uh, it really falls on uh, physicians uh, to resolve this problem. Uh, if it's a problem of the social environment, it's a little more complex. One possibility is that uh, people are failing in their parental responsibilities, uh, that, uh, that this is actually a kind of uh, decline in terms of the way that uh, children are being raised. Uh, they're not being fed the proper foods, uh, and uh, they're not being given sufficient uh, um, uh, training or, or education. Uh, another possibility is that it's the food industry that's really responsible for this, uh, that by um, uh, lots of attractive advertising, uh, creation of uh, foods that uh, are very tasty and that have wonderful mouthfeel and uh, that uh, are hard to resist, uh, that uh, they have actually lured us into uh, eating foods that uh, have less nutritional value and are much higher in uh, things like salt and sugar uh, and fat and that uh, the social environment were just surrounded by bad food uh, in a way that uh, wasn't the case in the past. Uh, and then um, uh, a final thing that gets mentioned is that uh, somehow it's the media, and I put the media here uh, to mean not just uh, newspapers and uh, television, uh, but uh, this, that there's something going on in terms of our broader cultural environment. Uh, which is uh, encouraging us to um, uh, eat more and not be particularly responsible uh, in the kind of food choices that we make. Now, if it's parents that are the way that we unpack this social environment analysis of the cause, uh, then it's pretty clear who's morally responsible. It's become something uh, that uh, parents uh, should take responsibility for, uh, and it, uh, we're, we're going to have a lag. We're going to have a, a generation who are going to experience uh, these kinds of problems, but uh, it ultimately is going to be a problem that only gets solved uh, when parents take uh, control. On the other hand, if it's uh, the food industry or the media, 
uh, then we are going to primarily look to the government to solve this problem. And we're going to look for uh, regulations, perhaps uh, uh, regulations that would, at a minimum, um, uh, provide much more information about the foods that we're eating. And a number of uh, states are passing laws that require uh, restaurants to provide uh, more detailed uh, dietary information and uh, so on. Uh, perhaps uh, actually even intervening in uh, things like, for example, our own domestic food aid program, which uh, uh, you can't uh, use food aid dollars to spend money on, uh, on uh, um, uh, alcohol or cigarettes. Uh, but you can use them to spend money on, uh, on uh, snack foods and uh, Cheetos and Hostess Twinkies and uh, 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 soda pop. And so some are suggesting that we need to intervene uh, at that kind of level. And perhaps we actually need to intervene in terms of some of the kind of uh, messages uh, that uh, are circulating in, uh, in our society. Um, and then if it turns out to be uh, individual decision making, it's really hard to know what, what we can do, right? What can we do um, other than perhaps, um, uh, you know, hire professors to go out and give talks like this and stigmatize bad decision making, sort of wag my finger and tell you, you know, uh, you're going to go have lunch after this talk and uh, I don't want to see anybody eating that cheeseburger and uh, the french fries, you know, you know, get your carrots and your veggies and, you know, something like that. Uh, and perhaps that actually, that kind of stigmatization actually does uh, suggest that government at least has a role uh, in, uh, in participating in a certain kind of uh, lecturing on uh, food quality. And this actually kind of brings me to my third challenge, which is kind of, you know, how food fits broadly into our sense of uh, culture and uh, our identity and our understanding of uh, who we are. Um, now, this is actually a, a problem that philosophers have spent very little time uh, thinking about. Um, there are uh, extensive uh, studies on uh, food and culture by anthropologists who are interested in studying food practices in other countries and why people uh, eat the kinds of things that they do and how they understand that. There's been uh, growing work by other social scientists really trying to understand uh, links between um, food and culture. And then uh, in philosophy, we do do a little bit, but it's all focused on aesthetics. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of like that uh, ancient work that, uh, you know, we're interested in, um, uh, in food primarily as a, a work of art or as a uh, expression of creativity or uh, the ideas of uh, daintiness or manliness or, or whatever that might be associated with certain kinds of foods. Not too much that's been done uh, within the standpoint of ethics. So I'm kind of on my own uh, here. I don't have many uh, shoulders to stand on. And I'm going to uh, fall back on some work that I've done in uh, the philosophy of agriculture, which is tries to draw a, a contrast between two philosophical ways of thinking about the whole food system from the beginning um, where you're growing food, planting food in fields, raising animals, uh, all the way up to the, the consumption end. Uh, and uh, one of them uh, I call an industrial philosophy of food systems, whereas the other I'm calling an agrarian philosophy of agriculture because I'm not sure how we expand this to the whole food system. So this industrial philosophy, um, which I could unpack at links that would truly bore you, um, uh, I'll summarize just really in terms of uh, uh, this thought. Uh, that we can think of uh, our agriculture or our entire food system just as one sector uh, in the industrial economy. Uh, and that uh, we have a general philosophy for how we think about the industrial economy should have performed and that we should think about the food system as uh, living up to those norms. And I'll give you a very simple understanding of what those norms are. Norm number one is that <clears throat> firms in an industrial economy should produce whatever goods they're producing efficiently and competitively. Um, you know, they should uh, uh, be uh, uh, offering them to us at uh, uh, the lowest possible prices. And the way that we do that is that we uh, create situations where the firms are competing with one another. Uh, but there is an important caveat to this, and that is, <coughs> excuse me, 
that we think of these firms as needing to, uh, as economists would say, internalize their costs. And what this means is that they really cannot produce in a way that um, uh, allows them to achieve greater efficiencies or, or to succeed in competition uh, by imposing costs on other people or harming other people. So uh, you can't, uh, uh, you know, lower your price of uh, steel uh, by uh, dumping all of the inconvenient byproducts into the local uh, stream. Uh, you can't uh, lower your cost of producing drugs by uh, putting the waste from that production uh, into the river or into the air. Uh, and you have to produce products that are safe and so on. So we create uh, a set of rules for the industrial economy uh, that uh, put firms into a position of uh, competing efficiently, uh, but then we uh, regulate, I know that's a dangerous word in some places, but we create a set of rules, the rules of the game. Uh, which is that this competition uh, has to uh, internalize all those costs and, and it's, it's, it's not going to be considered fair or appropriate to gain uh, efficiencies by uh, imposing costs on third parties. So we can really uh, unpack this a little bit by focusing on that word goods again uh, and ask uh, what makes something a good when we're thinking in this industrial mode. Well. Um, the, the thing that makes something a good is just the fact that people want it, right? Um, goods are anything that satisfies people's preferences, anything that they're willing to pay for, uh, anything that they desire. Um, if getting it makes them happy, it's a good. Uh, and economically, it's that they're willing to pay for it that really matters, right? So goods are uh, the things that we exchange uh, in the industrial economy, and it's the things that we exchange in an industrial economy uh, that we're focusing on as uh, needing to be produced efficiently uh, and uh, in ways that don't hurt other people. If we come back um, and uh, uh, take a little bit of uh, uh, return uh, to this um, um, obesity problem, uh, we would actually uh, think of this in um, the following way. Uh, what we really have to do uh, in an industrial economy is just satisfy individual wants. Um, they're going to be, you know, people are going to be able to uh, satisfy their preferences uh, to the maximal extent um, so long as we're not uh, violating individual rights. Uh, and this is going to um, leave us with uh, the uh, thought that really the only possible analysis here uh, is that it's the individuals uh, that are responsible. Uh, and as long as the firms are playing by the rules, um, if you have preferences uh, that are uh, giving you diabetes when you hit uh, age 35 or that are uh, leading you to a heart attack at age 48, uh, that's not the economy's fault, right? That's your fault, right? All of the, all of the, the blame uh, really falls on you. So this industrial philosophy uh, ties in very closely with this notion uh, that there's nothing really uh, socially uh, to think about here, that this is primarily a, an individual decision-making kind of problem. Now, I'm not going to argue against that. My point here today is to really try to unpack some of the philosophical dimensions of this. Uh, and so in that vein, I'm going to tell a couple of uh, stories of different ways that people have thought about agriculture and food systems in the past. Uh, and I'm going to start out with one that goes back to ancient Greece, right? I'm a philosophy professor, so I'm contractually obligated to mention ancient Greece at least three times in my talk. Uh, and then the second one I'll talk about uh, uh, a case at the uh, formation of, uh, of uh, the uh, United States. So um, this story comes from uh, Xenophon and Aristotle, although in fact the version that I'm going to tell you uh, really comes from Hegel. Hegel uh, uh, tells this story at some length in his uh, philosophy of history, uh, and it's a fascinating story uh, in its own right really starts out by, um, uh, Hegel starts out by asking us to uh, look at the geography of the ancient world. Uh, and uh, uh, we're supposed to notice uh, that uh, Greece is a country that uh, is quite mountainous, but it has a number of regions uh, where you can uh, produce uh, agriculturally. Uh, they're separated from one another uh, by these mountain ranges, uh, but uh, they are, um, uh, and this tends to create these 
smaller pockets of civilization, these city-states, uh, as uh, it was called in, ancient, uh, uh, in, in the ancient world, uh, that are relatively autonomous and, where, uh, and, and draw their food, uh, essentially have uh, uh, very locally organized uh, uh, food systems. And Hegel follows this after discussing Egypt. This is actually a modern map of Egypt because there's no Aswan da Dam in ancient <laughs> Egypt. So, so take all of that stuff and that's still blue, but in ancient Egypt, uh, the agricultural system, which was a marvel, uh, relied upon the annual flood of the Nile River. Uh, so the Nile River floods, and as it comes down to the delta, uh, it uh, floods and covers up much of this lower level uh, territory, uh, and the Egypt, Egyptian agricultural system uh, relied upon an elaborate system of trapping uh, the floodwaters of the Nile to maximize the uh, availability of the water, uh, and then uh, carefully uh, siphoning it down the river uh, and planting crops behind it. Uh, the Nile brought in a fresh uh, flood of uh, nutrients, uh, so they didn't have to add fertilizers. Uh, but uh, the way that you essentially do this is you need a very centrally managed uh, society. Uh, you need to have uh, a lot of people out there building the irrigation works, maintaining the irrigation works, uh, opening them, closing them, and doing all the field work. And those people were, of course, slaves. And then you have a very small elite class uh, that uh, pays attention to how all of this is managed. Uh, and uh, those were the priests. That was what the Egyptian priests largely did, uh, and uh, then at the end of the day, uh, you collect all this food and have to distribute it out, and that's all centrally done as well, and uh, elaborate systems are created to uh, take account of that, and uh, Hegel actually credits the Egyptians with uh, developing the whole idea of administration, and uh, uh, it, it uh, leads to uh, 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 ideas of accounting and some of the early ideas in mathematics and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, they are very hierarchically organized and centrally managed uh, society. Whereas in ancient Greece, the agriculture looks pretty different. This is a sort of a, a field level picture of what uh, 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 the agriculture in ancient Greece might have looked like. Uh, and uh, you've got some crops growing down there on the bottomlands, annual crops that get planted every year. Uh, and as you start to move up the hill, uh, you have sandy soils, you have a temperate climate, uh, you're able to uh, grow some vines, uh, and you're able to uh, uh, harvest some grapes. Uh, you also have some olive trees as you move a little bit farther up the hill. Uh, and then uh, you're also able to uh, put some uh, livestock, uh, sheep and goats primarily, that would be wandering around, uh, particularly under the trees. And then after you've harvested uh, your fields down at the bottom, uh, you can turn your livestock loose in there, and they'll fertilize the fields, and, and they'll eat uh, the, the leavings uh, after the harvest. Uh, and this is a system, unlike this massive army that it takes to manage the Egyptian system, that's ideally managed by a single household. Um, the uh, single household in Greece uh, would have included a landowner uh, and uh, his family. It probably would have included a few slaves, uh, but uh, these would have been slaves that would have been entrusted with quite a bit of responsibility in the work uh, and would have looked rather different uh, from the kind of slavery that uh, existed uh, in uh, ancient uh, um, uh, Egypt. I'm not going to try to defend slavery here, and I, I do want you to notice that there are slaves in this system, uh, but uh, uh, it's largely a household management. There's something, uh, chores change as the seasons change. You go get your crops in. There's nothing to do with the crops. Then you can go prune your grape trees. Then you can uh, uh, focus on your trees and managing your livestock. You go you know, devote all your labor to harvesting the crop. There's something going on at every stage of the year. And so you can keep uh, a, a household uh, uh, labor fleet, fleet busy. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, it becomes a very stable agriculture. Uh, the Greeks, however, did um, uh, uh, have a, a system of governance which involved, uh, again, uh, the male, uh, there's sexism in ancient Greece too, uh, going into the city uh, and, uh, um, you know, undertaking the various tasks of commerce, commerce and exchange uh, and governance that occurred in each of these uh, city-states. Uh, um, and part of the thing that the cities were focused on 
uh, was this possibility uh, that people from outside Greece would look at their uh, society and uh, decide, gee, we'd like to have that. Uh, and so they would organize uh, these gigantic armies uh, that would uh, threaten uh, the Greek agriculture. Uh, anybody uh, in here seen, uh, what's the movie recently? I should know this as a Michigan State Spartan, but uh, was it 300? Something like that. So at any rate, um, you know, you have to defend yourself against the Persians usually is who it is, right? The Persians come in, they'll burn down your crops, right? That's a problem. Nobody likes to have their crops burned down. But you can plant those crops again next year. Uh, the real problem comes when they start cutting down your vines and your trees uh, because it takes a lifetime to essentially develop the kind of agriculture that becomes uh, sim symptomatic of uh, ancient Greece. Uh, and so this creates a situation in which the heads of these households are uh, quite willing uh, to participate in the defense of the society. If you're a slave in ancient Egypt, you don't really have a lot of incentive uh, to defend ancient Egypt, right? That's, you know, you're, you're glad when somebody comes in and takes over that system, right? But these householders uh, are out there, they need to protect their agriculture, uh, and so they actually uh, participate in these local systems of governance, uh, and they also develop a particular form of response to these threats uh, that becomes the most potent agri uh, uh, force for warfare, for defense, uh, in the ancient world, and actually uh, drives uh, 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 ancient Greece to uh, the top of uh, the heap in terms of uh, the ancient world. So Hegel's point uh, is that uh, what happens is that the ancient Greeks uh, develop uh, a strong sense of citizenship. They s understand themselves as citizens of these states. You don't see that happening in ancient Egypt. Uh, they d uh, develop a strong sense of solidarity with one another. This particular military form uh, depends upon uh, each uh, soldier uh, feeling like they have absolute confidence in the person that's serving next to them. Uh, that's not a person that's going to abandon them in the middle of the night uh, seeking uh, uh, some uh, employer that's willing to pay them a little bit more to wield their sword. These are all people that are there uh, to defend their way of life. Uh, and so they have a sense of political community. Uh, and Hegel's argument is that this is really uh, the first time that this sense of political community uh, that can give rise to virtues such as loyalty or courage or friendship arises. I mean, Hegel may have been wrong about that. Uh, but his general point was uh, that you have a kind of moral sense of community and political loyalty uh, that actually depends uh, on the system of agriculture. That's Hegel's story. So let's uh, take a look at uh, uh, our story here in the United States. Uh, this story focuses on Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, both of whom were serving in the cabinet of uh, George Washington. Uh, and uh, they are facing a decision as to the United States doesn't have a lot of money at this point. It's a brand new nation. Uh, they've also uh, just uh, successfully uh, thrown out the British. Uh, but uh, in the process of throwing out the British, uh, they've uh, uh, seen a lot of people leave, right? I mean, if you're uh, sitting there um, facing uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, do you want to enlist and fight? Or is it better to maybe pull up stakes and head to Canada or down to the Bahamas or someplace where the British are still uh, in control. Uh, and uh, Hamilton and Jefferson have a debate about how the United States should plan its course of development. Uh, and uh, basically, Hamilton's idea uh, is that we should uh, build factories in New Jersey and start to compete with the Europeans uh, for textile manufacturing. Uh, and uh, uh, Jefferson's idea is, no, uh, let's uh, build farms and uh, we'll send our uh, cotton and uh, what all to uh, Europe, and they can mill it into clothing, uh, but we'll focus on uh, increasing our land base and, uh, and, and invest in farms. Um, uh, Hamilton's argument was uh, we need to be industrially independent. Uh, we, uh, you, know, w you know, these uh, British are making a ton with their textile factories. We can make money doing this as well. Uh, Jefferson's argument is uh, that no, uh, when we face this problem in the Revolutionary War, uh, who was it that showed up to fight? Who was it that uh, became part of the army? Who was it that felt like they had a commitment to the United States or to America as a political community? It was the farmers 
farmers, and they did it for basically the same reasons uh, the ancient, that the ancient Greeks did it, right? If you were making rum in Boston uh, and the war breaks out, you can make rum in Montreal or in Freeport, right? Uh, so you pick up your rum making and you hightail it, and uh, uh, manufacturers tended not to stick around. They tended not to support the United States as an emerging economy. But if you're a farmer and you're developing your land and you're putting uh, your identity into this land that you're developing, you're building fences and barns and so on, uh, then you've got to stick around and make the new society work. Uh, so Jefferson's argument was that's where we should go. Now the short uh, uh, story about how this turned out is that uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton got himself into a duel with Aaron Burr and was killed, right? So that settled the debate, uh, perhaps not on its merits. Uh, whereas Jefferson went on to become the third president uh, and uh, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase and was basically able to put his plan uh, into place uh, and we get launched on a history in which uh, agriculture actually is an important part of our national story. And if you're interested in that, um, uh, you can buy my book. <laughs> what I really want to do now is uh, kind of you know, pull back from this a little bit and ask just, you know, do, do these agrarian stories have any kind of salience uh, to us uh, today. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering whether or not, uh, uh, you know, we could actually today, I don't know that we need to tell the kind of story that Hegel told, uh, where uh, now a society where only 2% of our population actually are farmers. Uh, if we really uh, need to have a significant uh, uh, percentage of our people in farming to uh, have this sense of community that uh, Jefferson was interested in, we're basically screwed. Um, so, uh, but maybe we could tell um, uh, different kinds of agrarian stories and that uh, we could think about uh, our food system uh, as having resonance in our personal identities uh, and in our community identity, the kind of thing that pulls us together into a community that's able to tackle problems together in an organized way. And one way to think about that. Uh, uh, particularly uh, in developing countries might be that uh, uh, as we've moved into this more industrial organized food system, uh, we've tended to see the high value crops and the high value foods uh, the ones are the ones that the industrial society will uh, promote and develop and perhaps we should uh, think about, uh, we, we've actually seen in almost every case uh, that this has happened that there actually is a decline in the diversity of foods that people are eating and uh, that maybe some of the problems that we see in terms of uh, obesity might be uh, resolved by growing more diverse crops and actually having uh, a, more, a more biologically uh, div diverse agriculture uh, that would be available. Uh, uh, we also uh, can ask about uh, whether or not it's really such a good idea uh, to get uh, that 50 percent of people who are farmers out of farming and put them into uh, urban environments where they're still going to be uh, in extreme poverty. Uh, maybe the fact that they are farmers and that they're uh, doing something, that they're entrepreneurs of a certain sort, that they're, even though they're very poor, uh, that they have a certain sort of stake in their place and in their, their land uh, that uh, really is important to, to try to maintain. And perhaps we could uh, uh, think about uh, food cultures uh, that would actually go back to some of these other uh, virtues of uh, uh, temperance and uh, ask whether there would be uh, contemporary equivalents to that. Uh, I do have to admit, though, that in some respects this word agrarian is itself, you know, kind of the problem. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we just don't think in that kind of way anymore. We don't think in ways, our, our public uh, discourse doesn't really focus on uh, ways in which our material practices uh, actually uh, reinforce or cultivate certain notions of virtue. Uh, this is actually not, you don't actually hear any of the political, any of the p presidential candidates uh, talking about the way that material practices uh, cultivate notions of virtue, right? Um, and, and I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, I mean, we are listening to a lot of Republicans right now, but this isn't just a problem for the Republicans. This political discourse is just not really uh, available to us uh, anymore. It was very persuasive in Jefferson's time, uh, but uh, Jefferson praised farmers as being the best citizens and was able to make this link between farming and citizenship in very succinct ways, and it, it resonated. People understood what he was talking about. Um, but we don't really seem to have that vocabulary anymore. We really uh, seem to have lost that. So maybe we need to drop the agrarian and, and figure out some uh, other way to talk about that. I don't have the answer to that. 
that uh, problem. So I'll sum up here uh, by uh, uh, talking about, by, by just sort of uh, suggesting what each of my three, three uh, challenges are. Uh, first, we note that the food entitlements of uh, rural and urban poor are sometimes actually often in conflict, and that the policy responses that we've uh, undertaken in the West have uh, uh, encouraged overproduction of agricultural commodities, and it also may have actually skewed the selection of the crops that we produce and the foods that we eat. The second challenge is that uh, uh, we have a historically unprecedented uh, rate of availability of food, uh, and this is coupled uh, with uh, rising overconsumption and attendant health problems. Yet we lack, seem to lack uh, any uh, appropriate way to frame this problem as something that we can get a handle on. Um, it, it always seems to come back to just wagging our fingers at one another and uh, uh, lecturing one another. And then challenge number three, uh, farming and food production um, aren't really salient social practices anymore. We can't really talk about farming and food production uh, and, and use these as examples or ways of uh, talking about uh, how who we are as a people or what pulls us together as a community. And uh, these old philosophical accounts of uh, the virtues were linked to quotidian practices, things that people do every day without really thinking about them in any kind of deep philosophical way. Um, but uh, that really lacks resonance in our society. Uh, yet I would argue that clearly we need moral and political reforms uh, that are uh, associated with the more industrial notions of rights and social welfare. I'm not suggesting we get rid of the industrial vision. So uh, what I want to suggest is that when we look at the policy responses to problem number one, it actually has led in some respects to some of the things that we observe in number two. When we notice that we seem to lack a kind of appropriate moral vocabulary, uh, that actually ties us down to some of the changes that we've experienced in terms of uh, challenge number three, that uh, a whole ways of linking our daily practices to notions of virtue uh, seem to lack salience in our contemporary world. Uh, and so uh, that actually ties uh, all of these together. Now, that's a very impressionistic uh, account, but I've uh, kept everybody here uh, by far long enough, uh, and so I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Okay, 15 minutes. You can't leave if you're getting this for credit. <laughs> Anybody, I'll be happy to. Yeah. One floor below us, there is what's called the commons. Uh, the whole area where people eat and where the food was prepared and sold used to be called the commons. Now the preparation and sale of the food goes on in what's called a food court, mm -hmm. which has some symbolic appropriateness, I think. <laughs> uh, we also across campus have what's called the food zoo which is for the, mostly for the students who live in dormitories. Mm -hmm. are, are you aware of any efforts around the country to change the way these <coughs> places work and to change uh, uh, the social habits on university campuses and high school and grade school yeah. campuses? Yeah, that's a great question. And let me just mention some things that are going on at Michigan State. We have a uh, vice president for some long thing that has to do with how students live um, who uh, has really taken this on in a big way. And he's, he's approaching it dorm by dorm, right? So, um, you know, we haven't had any changes in our big, you know, the equivalent to this building, right? You know, there we have food courts very much like yours, but we also have a lot of uh, dining halls that operate out of uh, the residential complexes. And so what he has done is he's actually now created two of the dining halls and residential complexes that really focus on food, community, health, related kinds of themes. So, uh, you know, they're, um, you know, they're very careful about, you know, what they select. These are, you know, these standard kinds of uh, dining experiences where you pay a price and then you can go anywhere in the dining hall. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're linked to, we actually have, of course, have farms at Michigan State. So some of this is being grown on our organic farm. Uh, we also have, uh, 
uh, links to other kinds of local suppliers. So there's a kind of local cultural theme, uh, and there's uh, also uh, a lot of focus on uh, diet, and also a lot of focus on managing the waste that comes out of these facilities. Uh, and uh, so they, they actually kind of use this now as a recruiting tool, right? So students can come to Michigan State, they can choose whatever dorm they want to live in. They aren't forced into one of these dorms where we have this more, you know, kind of true commons notion of what the food practices there are. Uh, but uh, uh, part of the reason that we now have two of these dorms is the first one was so popular that uh, it was immediately oversubscribed. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, he's willing to uh, convert as many of these dorms over as we can, you know, get students to elect uh, living in this kind of environment. Uh, I've seen similar kind of things at some other uh, campuses I've visited. Uh, at the opposite end of the, you know, we have have uh, uh, over 40,000 students at Michigan State, but at the opposite end of the, exp uh, of the, of the uh, uh, spectrum is uh, Green Mountain College in Vermont, a uh, little tiny college, I think something like 800 students. Uh, they have a farm. They uh, are doing similar kinds of things in terms of uh, pulling things into their uh, dining hall. They're actually working closely with local dairy farmers, and they are hoping, I think by about now, to have gone completely off the grid and they're going to produce all the power that the university needs uh, from uh, cow manure uh, that they uh, get from local farmers. And they've sort of made uh, these notions of uh, sustainability into uh, the theme of the entire campus. And, uh, uh, you know, they actually, the agrarian vision is taught at <laughs> Green Mountain College. Uh, so um, I do think that there's um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different ways to go uh, with this. You can sort of focus on the health themes, you can focus on uh, the local uh, uh, community things, you can focus on the environmental impact. Uh, I think that uh, uh, ideally uh, you do all of those things and then try to think about how they might be connected with one another. And they aren't necessarily easy to connect. I mean, sometimes uh, uh, the thing that uh, uh, is great for local uh, community development is not so great environmentally and vice versa. So uh, it, uh, it one of the things that's, I think, particularly particularly interesting about Green Mountain is that they've actually, that we haven't done at Michigan State, is that they've actually built this into their curriculum, right? So they're thinking and talking reflectively about what's going on in terms of the campus practices to try to become more sustainable in the classroom. And uh, the instructors have really uh, tried to, um, uh, you know, kind of use the student living experience uh, as an important part of the, the curriculum as well. Are, are you aware of efforts to change social patterns beyond just the emphasis on the food? Because it would make a difference if occasionally, at least, students were having meals with faculty members. Sure, yeah. Well, that's that actually is happening at Green Mountain, not at Michigan State so much. I mean, I actually do go over to one of these dorms and eat and meet students over there. And it's OK, but it's not like, I mean, you know, with 40,000 students, it's not like I run into very many students I know <laughs> very often. But yeah, let me take another question. Um, yes. In terms of like larger solutions or like paradigm shifts, do you think that it'll come from like these, kind of what you're mentioning, like bottom up community driven sort of actions? Or do you think that it'll eventually have to come from like a policy structural more like top down. Well, I I think that the that policy top down stuff only works when you have a strong sense of community and of common fate, right? If if you think of, you know, the government as some remote entity that um, is just telling you what to do or setting the rules. Um, you know, you, you, certain kinds of policies, you know, you're, you sort of grudgingly acknowledge that, yeah, we got to have that. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are inconvenient for you and you may not really understand that there's a rationale. And plenty of them are just, you know, park, you know they're just not good policies, right? Um, so the, the prerequisite for having the top down is having um, enough of a sense of community, having the sense that uh, uh, people feel like they're citizens. I mean, that's part of what I really take from Jefferson, uh, part of what uh, Jefferson's real wisdom, that, that sustainability means that you have an investment and a sense of participation in your society, in your community. You think of your society as your community. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why food is a very appropriate place to begin uh, 
uh, is that I, I think that we sell food short as a potential source of community. It's, it's not something that uh, we typically debate about philosophically. I, as Dane said, I really am kind of a weirdo uh, in the philosophical tradition for, for, uh, for thinking about this kind of stuff. But what's unique about food is that we, we all eat, we all do it, you know, at least ideally we do it every day, usually a couple of times a day. Uh, we can talk with one another about it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, implicit uh, uh, ethical value that is embedded in our food practices for good and for ill. Uh, so, um, you know, focusing on food uh, is actually a very natural way uh, for us to start to explore where we actually might build community. Uh, you know, uh, partly that means, uh, hey, let's go out and get something uh, healthy and tasty, but it also means having respect for different values, right? I mean, we need to be able to respect people who uh, have food traditions uh, that might be ethnically or personally or historically important to them. So we can actually, um, you know, work our way through notions of, uh, of mutual respect and, hey, we don't all have to eat the same thing every day as, as part of our food culture. So I think it's a, it's a good lab uh, for doing some of this, and it's not something where you have to have uh, had a lot of philosophy courses to participate in those conversations. But let me go way to the back, and then I'll... Um, with regards to your uh, control on obesity, particularly the, uh, the food industry there and uh, the media, how can you expect the government to have regulations on that whenever the food industry is such a uh, large contributor to the lobbying money that goes to the federal government? Well, I think that your point's well taken. Um, the um, uh, I certainly know that uh, uh, agencies within the government are um, trying, to, are exploring ways in which they could uh, um, be more proactive. I actually gave a talk at the Center for Centers for Disease Control uh, last summer and uh, uh, met with a number of their policy group, uh, and they're very interested in where they can intervene, but they're also uh, keenly aware of the limitations of what they can do. Uh, and uh, they're also uh, keenly aware uh, that uh, uh, they could overstep their authority and they could also, uh, you know, really uh, irritate not just the food industry but uh, other sources of support. Even within the food industry, though, there's, there's a mix. You know, the food industry isn't monolithic and, and some firms are more willing to undertake uh, these kinds of changes uh, than others. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, they aren't really interested in giving you diabetes, they just want to make a buck. And um, if they can figure out how to do that, um, you know, they're quite willing to make some changes. Yeah? Um, I, I was, would you answer a question about the industrial ethic? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I was thinking about what you put up on the board or on the slide, and I was kind of wondering, how do we hold companies kind of responsible for their for the need for them to kind of play fair. And I'm wondering if, you know, what things do companies need to do in order to be playing fair so that we can blame the individual for their choices? <laughs> and I think it comes down to, if you, you know, if you're making choices to cut the cost of your product by replacing real, like, maple syrup with high fructose corn syrup, or if you're not reporting the ingredients or the right. way that they were farmed, right. um, you know, to what extent can we blame the individual if they don't know what's in the food that they're eating? So, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to unpack the industrial ethic, and I do, and one of the things that I didn't do was to really talk about some of the strengths of the industrial ethic. It really does give us some very potent tools for uh, thinking about the economy work, the way that the economy works, and for uh, responding to a whole set of social problems. And, you know, this idea that uh, you have a right to certain kinds of information is very compatible with an industrial conception of how the, uh, the food system should work. And it is, in fact, uh, the way that um, uh, agencies such as the CDC are kind of thinking. You know, they're very focused on um, information uh, programs and actually requiring. Uh, right now, it's FDA that writes the rules about uh, what actually, you know, the little label on your can of peas that talks about how much sodium it has and, you know, serving size and calories and so on. Uh, but they're working with people at FDA to think about, uh, you know, whether or not other kinds of information uh, would be uh, useful to require. I mean, you know, they, they're, they're approaching that responsibly. It costs money to put information 
information on uh, products. And uh, it also, uh, you can have too much information, right? I mean, you know, uh, has anybody uh, looked at a carton of uh, Ben and Jerry's lately and seen their explanation of, of uh, BST? Uh, that's actually, it's about a paragraph long, and they have to, you know, explain that their cows don't get BST, but they can't be sure that the people that make their chocolate aren't using milk from cows that gets BST, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's way too much information for anybody who's wanting some ice cream, right? Um, so there are, these are difficult problems to sort out, but, um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, what kind of information people are entitled to, uh, and uh, how to uh, structure information uh, certainly would be a way of, of pushing forward uh, that is a, a, something the government can do, uh, but that actually facilitates individual decision making and probably doesn't, um, you know, really constrain individual decision making uh, in, in too severe a manner. Have I used up all my time? Okay. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here.